many of you know, I am sure, only a few days ago, only last week, uh, President Obama welcomed to Washington, Washington Prime Minister David Cameron. Uh, that meeting was only the latest evidence of uh, 200 years of an extraordinary relationship between our two nations. As the President described it, uh, one of the greatest alliances the world has ever known. Uh, Sir Peter Westmacott is now the new custodian of the special relationship in Washington. And we are delighted, and he is the 48th British envoy to the United States. Uh, so we are delighted to have you uh, here in Chicago to talk to us about this relationship. As so often before in this special relationship, in our shared history, uh, the United States, United Kingdom, are working together to meet shared challenges in the world. Both of our governments are working hard at home and internationally uh, to help renew economic recovery and growth. Uh, we are cooperating along with other NATO partners to bring security and stability to Afghanistan. Uh, we are working to ensure the future of that alliance at a time of fundamental change in the threats we face around the world. And though it is often less heralded, our two nations have been constantly working in tandem to address the issues of hunger and poverty, of human rights and climate change uh, on the world stage. The ambassador's official biography is on your seats. Uh, I'll share with you a few highlights of it. Most important thing I, I want to observe for you in talking about Sir Peter um, is that we know from history that the uh, British diplomatic service uh, throughout Britain's history and throughout the modern period has played an ex exemplary role uh, as representatives of their nation, but also as key figures in addressing global then world international challenges. And Sir Peter is among the best of representatives of that great tradition. His own skills in diplomacy have been honed for 40 years now almost. And he has been recognized by Her Majesty the Queen with a knighthood for those accomplishments. Um, he has uh, come to Washington just a little over two months ago. Um, and already he has had to deal with the visit of a prime minister, um, always an interesting uh, effort. But he also managed to get to the Midwest already. We can't claim a first visit uh, to the Midwest for, on this occasion. I should note that that visit was, among other things, to attend an NCAA basketball game. <laughs> so Mr. Ambassador, you already get us. Um, and, uh, as President Obama um, and, uh, has, has said, uh, that's what the heartland is all about. Um, as the capital of the Midwest, Mr. Ambassador, uh, we welcome you very, very warmly. And I have been advised that I might paraphrase the President and say that we are all chuffed to bits that you are here. For those of you who don't, get that phrase, go look up your translation from American English to British English Dictionary. Um, prior to serving as ambassador here in Washington, uh, Sir Peter was the British ambassador to France uh, and then uh, and from 2007 to 2011, and as, prior to that as ambassador to Turkey. He's, he's had many distinguished postings, including in Tehran and Brussels, and he served as deputy private secretary to His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, from 1990 to 1993. He has a personal connection to the US which I must finally mention. In 1942, his father arrived in Norfolk, Virginia, unintended visit, uh, on board the aircraft carrier HMS Illustrious, uh, which, on which he was serving and which had been badly damaged uh, during its role in protecting Malta from Luftwaffe attacks. Uh, she needed months of repair, and the ambassador's father had an opportunity while in Norfolk to get to know the American people. And 
I've been told that he, has ne he never forgot uh, that experience and the warm welcome he received. Ambassador Westmacott, welcome to Chicago. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to your remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming you. Marshall, thank you very, very much for those warm words. It is a, a real treat and privilege to be here. Thank you all for coming along this evening. Um, to come and talk a little bit, not so much about what some people would call, but I can't possibly comment, the special relationship, but to talk about the, the twin summits of the G8 and, and NATO. Uh, so soon after the Prime Minister's visit last week is, uh, is a great treat because we are feeling at the moment, uh, my colleagues and I, as if there really is some, some real substance to the relationship uh, between the two governments, the two countries, that we've got lots of serious work to do together. And uh, this is therefore a good time uh, to think about some of those things, but also uh, a marvelous moment to look ahead a bit to the, uh, the big summit that's coming here of NATO, would have been of course with the G8, but that's now going to go to uh, Camp David instead. Uh, but I'm here really uh, in many respects to try to prepare for that and I shall have the great privilege of coming back to this to this marvelous city uh, with my Prime Minister and other colleagues when they're here for that summit. But last week was very special, and uh, as uh, Marshall has just said, uh, the, the President was very gracious in his remarks uh, about the United Kingdom, about his friend David Cameron, and he did speak of a relationship which was, and I quote him, the strongest it's ever been. And that's kind of how it feels at the moment, but it's also how it needs to be given the number of dangerous and difficult challenges uh, which face us all uh, out there at the moment. So, as you can imagine, it, it follows from that that to be just two months into this job uh, feels like a fantastic privilege. And coming back after 15 years or so here uh, to Chicago uh, is an equally great privilege. So, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation. Somebody said to me, don't worry if you can't read your text, just wing it a bit. And I said, well, I'm kind of used to doing that, and I may have to because my eyes are a bit flaky today. Uh, so if I, if I don't make a lot of sense, you'll have to bear with me. Or if you see me throw the papers away in a rage, uh, you, you might get something rather better than what I'm supposed to be saying. <laughs> but here goes. Let's see how we get on. Um, but Marshall, thank you for those words, and thank you also, Neve, for having me here. I'm afraid I'm not a president or a prime minister or any of those other very distinguished people who you've got coming ahead, but if you've got people of the caliber of Chris Patton at Chancellor of Oxford University, who's a remarkable guy, and President Abdullah Gül of Turkey, who's a, a good friend of, of ours too, I think you're, you're in very good shape, uh, not to speak of Madeleine Albright and all the other luminaries who are coming along uh, uh, in the next few weeks. To be here uh, talking about our common interest between Britain and the United States in, in having a safer and a more prosperous future is of course something which is uh, tremendously important to us all. Prime Minister will be back here a little bit later on uh, to look after our interest at the summit and your phrase but also what the Prime Minister said last week because this is the heartland is what it's all about. And Britain's relationship with this city, with this region is tremendously important in lots of other ways for both sides. Our annual trade with Chicago is almost $6 billion. In something of a rarity in a relationship like this, there's a pretty good balance between the two of us. It's almost $3 billion in both directions. And our investment between Britain and this part of the United States is just as important as that. There are a number of Chicago businesses with big presences in the United Kingdom. Kraft, for example, is not only there as a result of the acquisition of Cadbury, but it's also a very important sponsor of our London Olympics through that subsidiary. We also in Britain host operations of some of Chicago's most innovative and advanced companies, pharmaceutical giants like Baxter and Abbott Laboratories, but manufacturers also in different fields like Boeing, Motorola Solutions, and I discovered just now Wrigley, even though Wrigley are of course now part of the Mars family. An increasing number of Chicago high-tech startup companies are also moving to and growing fast in our tech city, which is where we are ourselves busy trying to encourage bright young people with brilliant ideas, skipping through broadband to mobile to set up their businesses and take advantage of new technology to create growth and the jobs which we all need. 
were also fostering a relationship with 1871, which is, uh, I'm sure as you know, a new incubator soon to open in the merchandise mart. And of course, in the financial sector, London is still the world's top city for international banking and financial services. So financial service companies like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Allstate, CNA, Northern Trust, have all opened up shop in the city. And more generally, our links with the exchanges here, the futures exchange, the derivatives, commodities, remains a fundamental part of the financial services and uh, commodities trade, which we have in the UK as well. We are proud that we have a strong British presence here in your city as well, including big companies, some of whom represented here tonight, like BP and HSBC, Willis, insurance company Diageo, and innovators and, and inventors like James Dyson's company. Britain is the largest foreign employer in Illinois, supporting almost 52,000 jobs. So it's a deep, dynamic relationship which reflects our role as a global hub and Chicago's role as a global hub of its own and a global city and, of course, the gateway to everything that goes on in the Midwest. It's, it seems as if my time here... <laughs> I told you it was going to be problematic. <laughs> The relationship not just about business and about, and about investment, but also goes back to the very early days of uh, this city. Not necessarily quite as friendly then as it is now. And this is the little reference back which somebody's tucked into my text and which of course I temporarily forgot, about Fort Dearborn being built at the mouth of the Chicago River in 1803, and of course during the War of 1812 was besieged and overrun by the Potawatomi forces allied with Great Britain. <laughs> All this talk of 1812 is, as you can imagine, one of the problems of doing this job and certainly arriving in the United States uh, in 2012. <laughs> <laughs> Seems as if I'm going to have to spend my time apologizing for things that happened 200 years ago. I've already been in the White House where they have shown me the marks of where we burnt down the original building. <laughs> and where they've left the black smoke traces in the basement rather than cover it with fresh whitewash. <laughs> I think it's extremely unfair because in 2014, which is actually the anniversary of that particular episode uh, towards the end of the War of 1812, that's when my successor in Paris, where I was until two months ago, will be celebrating something rather more positive, which is the 200th anniversary of the purchase of a great palace by the Duke of Wellington, uh, which is now and has been for the last 200 years the British Embassy. So I wasn't wholly sure when I came here and told you you're going to have to explain away 1812 that I was getting a fair deal when he was going to celebrate 1814. <laughs> but as they say, that's, uh, that's what we get paid to do sometimes. Fortunately, our historical ties with the city took a turn for the better after the formal incorporation of the city of Chicago, which I'm told is 175 years ago this month. And as the city grew from 92nd most populous in America in 1840 to the ninth biggest in 1860, and I think now the third uh, most important and most populous of the country, many of the newcomers were, of course, immigrants from Britain and from Ireland, as we have been hearing this week during all the St. Patrick's Day celebrations. Another area where being British ambassador in Washington is not always the easiest part <laughs> of the function. But allow me to say that the, the sitting there listening to the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland, one of whom, uh, former member of a, you know, a member of a, what was one of the hard right-wing Protestant parties 15, 20 years ago, and the other of which was a member of Sinn Féin, Martin McGuinness, his deputy, and they were at daggers drawn and worse 15 years ago, but hearing them talk about their shared responsibility and their shared vision to work together for the future of all of Ireland was actually a rather moving experience just two days ago in Washington. So perhaps the days of having to apologize for history and potato famines and the rest of it, for which of course we had no responsibility, um, <laughs> are, are now going to become a little bit more of history. Now the British government of course was here early on as well, uh, in, as Chicago established itself, and in 1855 we established our first trade office, and that evolved into the Consulate General, so ably represented, so ably headed by uh, my friend Robert Chatterton Dixon, who you heard just now. In 1893, at the Chicago World's Fair, British photographer Edward Mybridge showed very moving pictures of animal locomotion, and the building he used, which is the Zoo Praxographical Hall, was, of course, the first, world's first commercial movie theater. 
Chicago Nobel laureate Jane Addams' work in Chicago for the urban poor was in fact inspired by Toynbee Hall in London, which she visited back in 1888. Now I'm conscious that there are in fact all sorts of wonderful stories like this about the history between Chicago and Britain, but my Prime Minister will wrap my knuckles if I use them all up. So I think I brought a set that aside and move on to some of the more serious business which I have been asked to talk about, which is the British perspective of uh, these two important summits which are coming up. Now, I think although the, the G8 summit is, as I was saying just now, going to be at, at Camp David rather than here, I think the two do need to be seen in something of the, the same context. Both, of course, are going to be held under the United States chairmanship, so both will therefore be, of course, a huge success. But there's also a common theme. Both institutions, the G8 and NATO, are addressing continual change in the outside world and within themselves and need to face up to those challenges. The two began with very different purposes, one economic, the other about security, but both have evolved over time to share a surprising number of the same priorities. And I'll try and say a little bit uh, about what I mean by, by that. NATO, of course, was formed to provide collective security against the Soviet Union after the Second World War. In the years immediately prior to the adoption of the treaty, the West had seen the Soviets flex their muscles across Europe. They had supported communist insurgents in the Greek Civil War, backed the coup in Czechoslovakia, and in perhaps the most worrying sign, blockaded Berlin, which was an existential threat to the stability of post-war Europe, if not of Western civilization. And in response to all that, the free nations of Europe and North America came together to reaffirm their commitment to and support of each other. NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty, Article 5 in particular, was one of the first and best assertions of the importance of collective security, the notion that an attack against one is an attack against all. But security is only one part of a successful and stable society, so prosperity and economic stability matter too, and that's where the G8 comes into the equation. Collaboration amongst the world's major economies began in response to the global oil crisis of 1973. The first summit of the G6, as it then was, was a reflection of a common belief in the need for international cooperation on economic issues. As other countries emerged, not just as economic powers, but as winning proactive partners in the global system of trade and free markets, the G G6 welcomed them in, expanding to the membership that we now have of, of eight members. So the original purpose of NATO and the G8 may have evolved, but the institutions remain, as does their grounding in a Western set of values rooted in democracy and liberal economics. They remain fit for purpose to face up to the challenges today. For NATO members, obviously the Soviet Union is no more. The threat to nations of Europe and North America is not, therefore, from Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, from a defined state actor with clear borders and territorial uh, ambitions, or from their diplomats or their standing army. Instead, what we're facing up to is a global asymmetric threat from enemies who live and fight in the shadows. So our shared defense now takes a different form. It's less about battle lines, tanks, air bases, air-to-air -air combat, more about information, intelligence, the ability to respond rapidly as new threats emerge. This includes the ability and willingness to project power to the source of those new threats. No single country these days can stand guard alone when everybody is a potential target. This makes international cooperation and collective security all the more important. Similarly, turning back to the G8 for a moment, that organization, that group of countries, is no longer the place where all the world's economic decisions are made. The original G6 was the driver of the entire world's economic system, but growth over the last few decades has brought new economies into the mix. From 97 to 2007, those G6 countries saw GDP growth of 1 or 2 percent. But outside, other growth was much faster. In Russia, 5.7 percent. China, almost 10 percent. India, 7. And the financial crisis of 2008-2009 showed that we needed to meet at heads of government level in a much bigger group if we were going to face up to the challenges which that crisis threw up. So as a result, we've now got decision-making shifting much more to the group of G20, which we think is a good thing. It reflects the growth and spread of global prosperity and ultimately can lift 
tens of thousands of people out of poverty if properly handled. When the G20 was started, the main question was what would become of the G8? What was its purpose anymore? And the G8, as we see it today, is actually answering that question in a positive manner. It's the place where leaders come together to share ideas more informally than they can in other venues. And I think that is why President Obama has taken the decision to take people up in very small delegations to Camp David rather than to put them in a great big conference center where the risk is that the exchanges remain too institutionalized. It's the group now that sets an example. We may no longer be driving the direction of the global economy by sheer size, although in fact the G8 countries are still extremely important in that context, but this is also now the home of innovation, of new policies, of fresh thinking. And we put ourselves on the forefront to show the rest of the world what can be done and to spread some new thinking. And the G8 has also moved beyond just economic issues like finance and trade and is taking a leadership on global development, building democratic capacity, climate change, and other big issues. These new roles for both NATO and the G8 mean that their member states are working in tandem towards achieving a variety of common goals. None better reflects this view than the shared direction of NATO and its shared commitment, and indeed the involvement of the G8 along their side in Afghanistan, one of the big topics which will be on the agenda of both G8 and uh, the, G the NATO summit here in Chicago. NATO troops, led by the United States of America and the United Kingdom uh, in a supporting role, but in a co coalition that eventually included more than 30 different countries, went to Afghanistan in response to the terrible attacks of 9-11. And the carnage that the world saw that day was a broadside by the new asymmetrical enemy operating invisibly in the shadows, a stark and startling announcement of his global reach and devastating capability. The military response was to eliminate al-Qaeda, which had perpetrated the atrocities, to remove, to remove from power those who had given safe haven in Afghanistan and to prevent Afghanistan again becoming a base from which such operations could be launched. Fighting shoulder to shoulder, we were able to take back Kabul within a few months, remove the Taliban and install an Afghan government. And our goal over that last 10 years since all that began has been to protect that government as it develops the capacity to protect itself and to run its own country. Progress has been uneven but progress there has been over the last decade. The strategy is now focused, the coalition is strong, and our Afghan partners are fully engaged. We have the resources, we have the will to succeed. The Afghan National Army and the National Police are beginning now to stand up on their own, which is allowing NATO troops to transition into a more training and mentoring role. The total size now of the Afghan Army is over 300,000 men. Their training has been overseen by NATO forces and they're being prepared to take on that responsibility for their own defense uh, without foreign support. Both Britain and the United States, far and away the two largest contributors, of course, have begun to bring their troops home. And this is happening in accordance with the strategy laid out at the last NATO summit held in Lisbon. There's still, of course, a lot of work to be done, but we believe that we're on the right track Close cooperation and candid communication with our allies will keep us on that path until we reach the end of combat operations at the end of 2014 and then move to more of a training and support role. These advances have been made possible. I've skipped something very important. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> Only by a few words. Um, this military effort these advances, which I mentioned, have been made possible by determined NATO military cooperation, but also by a civilian, a civilian effort, which has featured the deployment of development and stability instruments by a number of G8 countries. They haven't operated through the G8 as an organization because it's institutionally not all that strong, but the G8 has shown its worth as a coordinating group and in setting an example to the others. And the collaboration has paid off. On top of the progress that I've just tried to outline on the security side, As Afghanistan is unrecognizable from what it would look like 10 years ago when we began. Six million children now attend school on a regular basis, five times more than in the days when the Taliban were in control. 
more than two million of them are girls. And the Taliban were there, of course, their oppressive rules about women's role in society and the iniquities of girls' education meant that there were virtually no girls going to school in Afghanistan. 57% of the population today can access a healthcare facility within an hour's walk of their home. Life expectancy for both men and women has increased by a full 20 years since 2002, and that now stands at the age of 62. All this is possible because of the international community's collective commitment to making a success of what we began a decade ago. And the ending of our combat role at the uh, close of 2014 will not be the end of that commitment. We will continue to assist with the training of Afghanistan's forces, and our development programs will continue to help Afghans maintain a country with a government in place in Kabul and in the provinces that can do its job, a country with a civil society that provides education and basic services, and an economy based on legal trade as opposed to illicit cultivation of poppies and export. And most importantly, perhaps, a country that can prevent the forces of terrorism ever again using Afghan territory as a safe haven for operations that threaten our countries and our peoples. That will remain the focus through our meetings of NATO here in Chicago and of the G8 in Camp David. Of course, the G8 and NATO summits are about more than just the one issue which I have focused on until now. Afghanistan will be a common thread through both, but leaders will also have to address many other issues which are important to all the member states, and will have to ask some questions and answer them about the future of the organizations themselves. As people come together here in Chicago at the end of May, they will look to find ways to provide for defense and security in the face of tightening national budgets around the world and discuss how we maintain our obligations and continue to provide the necessary security in smarter ways, which cost less money but improve cooperation. It's an issue in which we think that the United Kingdom is showing the way. We are taking a scalpel to our defense budget, not a sledgehammer, but while we are implementing those cuts, we are investing in capabilities that we need for the future and which we believe will serve a useful role for the Alliance in the future. Even after the budget cuts that we are having to apply, Britain will still have the world's fourth largest defense budget. We will still be one of only five NATO allies, including, of course, the United States, that meets the target agreed by the whole alliance of a defense budget of 2% of gross domestic product. We're shifting resources into building armed forces that are flexible, adaptable, deployable, better trained, better equipped to face the changing threats of the 21st century. The capabilities of these forces were on display most, re most recently in Libya, which we think is the most recent of NATO success stories. There, the NATO coalition, led visibly by Britain and France, but supported so critically by United States, protected civilian life, answered the call for action from partners in the region, as well as from the population of Libya, and implemented the conclusions of the United Nations Security Council. It is a feather in the cap of NATO in the modern world that it reacted so quickly and so effectively to that call. Targeted airstrikes carried out with state-of-the-art aircraft, unmanned aerial vehicles, smart, intelligent munitions, saved innocent lives, minimized collateral damage, ultimately led to the overthrow of a tyrant. We still have to ensure a civil society and that representative government can take root in Libya and bring them in as a partner in the region once again. The Dobil partnership, which was set up by the G8 at their last meeting, will play an important role in helping out transition. But Libya is a country with a six million population and tremendous natural assets and a great deal of national wealth ought to be up to the charge and we will play our part, all of us together, in helping ensuring that they do. The lesson from all that activity is that NATO is the vehicle for taking action in an international coalition. There just isn't an alternative that works. Libya, I would argue, also provides a stellar example of how international cooperation can help uh, deal with shrinking national defense budgets. We can share each other's burdens, even our stocks of missiles and ammunition, which allows all of us to do more in tough times more effectively. In other parts of the world, our combined naval presence in the Arabian Gulf has deterred any intentions to close the Straits of Hormuz to international trade in the context of the current 
crisis with Iran over its nuclear weapons program. Similarly, the International Coalition's naval operations off the coast of Somalia have begun to stop pirate attacks on global shipping. The cost of defending our countries and our citizens against these dangers that affect us all is clearly one that needs to be shared. And one way of doing this more efficiently, sometimes overlooked, is to ensure that our defence procurement is as efficient and equitable as possible. The United States, United Kingdom Defence Trade Cooperation Treaty that comes into force next week is an important step towards that goal for Britain and America. Components and products from companies like Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Boeing and many other US defence contractors have long played a part in equipping the United Kingdom's armed services with the material that they need. Boeing's support, for example, for Chinook helicopters in Afghanistan has been outstanding. But British companies like British Aerospace and capabilities like Storm Shadow and Brimstone, which were tried and tested in Libya as well as in Afghanistan, all have their part to play in the international inventory of defence equipment, and we would like to see our friends here in the US military looking to Britain too to source some of their requirements as we increasingly work together on both missions and capabilities. This treaty, therefore, needs to make our own defence procurement more of a two-way street and more a subject of the cooperation which already exists in our operations. The treaty also illustrates how our allies and close friends can approach issues where they sometimes have different objectives and priorities, discuss them with candour and reach mutually beneficial solutions. Budgets, of course, will be on the minds of the leaders who gather together at the G8 and here in Chicago, and the question for them to answer is going to be how we can expand our own prosperity and encourage economic development around the world, as well as find the resources to assure our national security. Britain's answer is the same as the one that we've been pushing through at G20 meetings in Deauville, the same we've been pushing through the World Trade Organization, through the European Union, at NATO, and the same message which the Chancellor of the Exchequer was developing this morning when he announced the uh, annual budget in the House of Commons in London with a particular emphasis on the need for growth, prosperity and a more business-friendly uh, economic environment in Britain. All this boils down to uh, a fresh and widespread priority on open markets and free trade to develop the prosperity which we all need and for which, to be honest, there is precious little public funding uh, freely available uh, to spend on uh, the economic activity which is essential if we're going to achieve those objectives. Part of the answer to this is, of course, more free trade. It lowers prices for consumers and manufacturers. It promotes competition and innovation. It creates more high-paying jobs. The verdict is clear that that is the direction that we have to go in these difficult economic times. And that was part of the message which the Prime Minister and President Obama themselves examined while they were looking at solutions to the global economic crisis together last week. Opponents of more free trade say that it puts developed country manufacturers in a position that they've got salaries to try much higher than our levels and can compete with lower wages in the developing world. We think this is too short term a view and we think that the strong base of education innovation that we have in Britain and America puts us in a position to take them on to manufacture and export better to develop new technologies and new solutions develop and exploit our comparative advantage in aerospace and advanced manufacturing at the same time. And we don't think that opening up our economies to more trade kicks off a race to the bottom. In addition to giving consumers quality products at lower prices, it creates prosperity in other countries which themselves become markets for our products and is therefore part of the way in which we can fight our way out of the current difficult environment. In December, the launch of a new European Union, United States high-level working group will result, we believe, in a new initiative to try to free up trade between Britain, sorry, between the European Union and the United States, developing the $1 billion worth of trade which we already do. This again, something which the President and the Prime Minister are attached to. Of course, we need to work on it with our other European partners. But if we can't do more on trade between the European Union and the United States, we're not going to do very well in lowering trade barriers and developing more free trade with other groups. Deeper than the specific issues or 
policies that may be addressed at the G8 and NATO summits, these organizations are also going to have to face up to questions about their institutional future. I'll just say a word or two about that. Neither economic power nor population is concentrated solely in the Western world anymore. By 2050, the five economies of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and Mexico are projected to exceed those of the G7 by almost $20 trillion. While Russia is already in the G8, how will international institutions arrest the rise of these additional new powers? And the answer to that question will depend on how they interact with the global community. And here we have a role to play as well in the G8 and in the G20. Brazil, India, and China have all shown influence in their regions, but they have yet to extend their hands as willingly into exercising the global responsibility, which is now becoming their due as well as ours. Russia is a global actor. Her actions seem more focused on advancing their own interests than on the global good. And sometimes the challenge facing us in the Western organizations, as in the case this week of Syria, is to try to show them that in fact their national interests are much more closely aligned to the global good than perhaps they sometimes think. For rising powers and established ones to cooperate fully in respected international institutions, all will need to display greater willingness to act globally in line with economic weight and to assume the responsibility that that economic weight confers on them. On them. It's an approach reflected in how the United States and the UK see our respective roles in these international organizations. For Britain, we seek to magnify our impact through cooperation with like-minded countries. For America, with its more expansive military and economic resources, it tends to work more through NATO and the G8 to find consensus for its own actions abroad, inviting others to join coalitions of the willing as appropriate. Whatever the specific answers turn out to be, the fundamental tenet of any successful organization is to adapt to change, not just adapt individually to isolated events. Given how NATO and the G8 have adapted themselves throughout their recent history, I'm confident that they will face the future with reason, with resolve, and with successful outcomes. In its preamble, the North Atlantic Treaty, to which we are so attached, says the parties to this treaty are determined to safeguard the freedom, common heritage, and civilization of their peoples, founded on the principles of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. That's a statement of purpose meant to last through the ages, and it is echoed in the words of President Truman when he put the treaty before the Senate in April of 1949. And he said then, the security and welfare of each member of this community depends upon the security and welfare of all. None of us alone can achieve economic prosperity or military security. None of us alone can assure the continuance of freedom. 25 years after the creation of NATO, the advent of the G6, now the G8, has enabled the world and its leading members of the international community to start making a reality of that vision articulated by President Truman. Today, we're still working together to take forward economic prosperity. We're still working together to achieve military security against a series of evolving, different, difficult, complicated threats. We're still working together to ensure the continuance of freedom of what he said. Those are the challenges which are before us at these two very important summits coming up under American chairmanship. We are confident that they will be extremely important in ensuring that we stick with that vision. And I can assure you that the United Kingdom stands ready to play its part in supporting the United States chair in guaranteeing the success of those meetings and in helping to ensure that the outcomes that they reach will have real practical effect for the economic prosperity and for the security of the world as a whole. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. We now have a few brief moments for questions, so if you could please raise your arm and make sure that you're keeping your questions as brief as possible. Yes, over there in the corner, please. Yes, you, thank you. One second, please wait for the mic. She's coming right now, thanks. Hi, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Elizabeth. I'm a graduate student in Paris, actually, so 
Hi. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. Um, my question was regarding the relationship with Russia. You touched on it kind of uh, briefly, but um, obviously the situation in Syria has highlighted the dynamics within the United Nations Security Council regarding Russia. But the European reliance on Russian energy, 40% of oil and gas coming from Russia, would suggest that Europe has kind of a responsibility or has made itself vulnerable um, to Russian influence. So I wondered kind of what the future you think of NATO and Russia, their relationship, as well as the relationship with Russia and the G8. I touched on it uh, rather briefly or quite right, perhaps partly because I'm not a Russia expert. But let me give you a couple of comments on that. I think you're exactly right that we need to think carefully about our energy dependence on Russia. That's one reason why uh, the United Kingdom is taking a lead, and indeed British company is in the lead, in trying to construct a new gas pipeline called Shah Deniz from the Caspian Sea, which bypasses Russia and will bring gas to Western Europe and beyond, and which is an issue which I'm very much aware of because there is a risk, if we're not very careful, uh, that this success of this project gets caught up in sanctions legislation currently going through the United States Congress. Uh, Russia, more generally, is a country with which my country has had very complicated relations, uh, partly perhaps because sometimes we were uh, the small dog it was easier to kick when you can't kick the big dog, which might bite back. Um, <laughs> but we've also had problems because the Russians, unfortunately, uh, got into, if not the habit, then certainly uh, on occasion, uh, attacking their opponents on the streets of London and we don't much take to uh, other governments trying to poison their political opponents uh, on UK territory. <laughs> it's been complicated actually for a number of years. Uh, we've had harassment of the British Council, uh, we've had harassment of British diplomats, but much of that is now getting better. And my Prime Minister paid a visit to, the, so to Russia the other day uh, for the first time in about five years where there was a very, very strong and uh, amicable dialogue with both uh, Putin and Medvedev. And we, th we like to think that that may be the beginning of, uh, of better times. As far as Syria is concerned, it is a very interesting case. I don't want to talk about this for, for too, too long, but when you follow on uh, the example of Libya, where the Russians clearly think that they made a mistake in, in agreeing with us that the, the Security Council of the United Nations should authorize action uh, to protect the civilian population and carry out the other elements which were in Security Council Resolution 1973, uh, they have been firmly against the idea of NATO or indeed the Security Council uh, taking action on behalf of the civilian population in Syria being slaughtered by Bashar al-Assad's regime. And yet, uh, there are some signs that on the Russian side, uh, they are not comfortable with the position that they are in. They are not comfortable with standing by and watching another tyrant slaughter his people. There have been some signs of some suggestions from the Russian side, not quite what we, the United States, France, uh, on the Security Council have in mind, but an indication that perhaps Russia also realizes that Syria would be better for them if there was a transition uh, from the present arrangement to a dialogue with the political opponents rather than a continuation of a set of policies which has every risk, if nothing is changed, of descending Syria into a deeply destructive and bloody civil war which wouldn't even serve Russia's interests. So I think uh, there is um, reasonable hope that we can continue that dialogue, a reasonable hope that we can find common ground, a reasonable hope that we can find that Russia, uh, not just on, uh, on the occasion of Libya, uh, may become a more productive and constructive partner for us uh, in the Security Council of the United Nations and more generally. So let's see where we go. It's a complicated relationship and civil society in Russia is itself evolving. Political expectations is evolving. The social media in Russia are very much more present than they were before. Things are happening there. And so, uh, being by nature an optimist, I think that we might be in, I hope we might be in for uh, a more positive time in that particular area of international relations. Next question. Yes, right here, please, in the third row. Um, the microphone's right there. Yeah, that's fine. The microphone's right there. Yeah. Um, Britain uh, did not adopt the euro, which is a decision that appears to be looking wiser and wiser all the time. Um, as a interested but not participating observer. I wondered what you think uh, will happen to the euro. Will, Greek, will the Greeks withdraw? Will the euro fall apart? Uh, will it s stay strong um, or as strong as it is anyway now? Um, where, where do you think the future of the euro lies? 
If I knew the answer to that, I would probably be an extremely wealthy man. <laughs> the United Kingdom has almost as much interest as any member of the Eurozone in the Eurozone sorting out its problems, resolving the sovereign debt crisis. Half our foreign trade is with the rest of Europe, 40% of it with the other members, with the members of the Eurozone. So although we're not in there for all sorts of reasons, and you're quite right, it looks more and more as if it was the right decision uh, to stay out of it, uh, we want that problem resolved. Uh, where is it going to go? Well, at the moment, it's been a long and laborious process, but the European Central Bank has begun uh, providing some of the liquidity which was deeply necessary in order to keep the money flowing within the Eurozone. There is good progress towards creating the firebreak which would limit the contagion from the weaker economies of the Mediterranean members of the Eurozone uh, in the event that th they got themselves into default or something worse. Uh, there has been some very effective action to strengthen the capital base of the European banks, many of which were excessively exposed to what has become a very uh, weak Greek debt. And there has been a deal, a voluntary deal, with all the private sector creditors who had lent money to Greece so that they themselves would accept that they're only going to get back something between, I think, 25-35% uh, of the value of the loans that they made. Most, of course, are insured, uh, so they will probably not suffer to that great extent. The result of all this is that the cost of uh, sovereign debt inside the Eurozone has begun to fall quite significantly. Some are still very much uh, more expensive than others. Portugal is still giving grounds, grounds for concern. But it feels, and the experts who I talk to in the financial services side of the British uh, government tell me that they feel that the moment of uh, imminent implosion has perhaps passed, but that we're not yet out of the wood. That is to say, the Eurozone, by doing the things that it has done in the last few weeks and months, has certainly bought itself some time. There is less of a sense of panic. But I think, to be honest, there are still questions out there as to whether Greece will be able to honor the commitments that it has had to give as part of its rescue package. There are still questions out there as to whether the Eurozone will be able to address the structural imbalances which are at the heart of the problems that it has had uh, in the last few months. So, long way to go, uh, important work still to be done. Uh, we will do what we can, but from the edges, because it is absolutely in our interest that the Eurozone gets its act together but I'm not going to be unwise enough to predict uh, what's going to happen or whether Greece will stay in or will have to uh, undertake an orderly default and or leave the Eurozone. That's uh, above my pay grade, uh, but what I, what I can say is that I'm quite certain that the Eurozone governments themselves would like to keep the Eurozone together and are ready to do, say they're ready to do, the things that are necessary to ensure it can happen. There is no provision for departure from the Eurozone. It will be very difficult and very messy if somebody has to go, and if one goes, it becomes quite complicated. But uh, that's as far, I think, as I can usefully comment. Um, let's hope uh, that all those uh, real difficulties are resolved and, and resolved in a definitive and lasting way in the coming months. Mr. Ambassador, it's very apparent from the very wide-ranging and thoughtful remarks you share with us that uh, serving as your country's representative of the United States and playing the key role that you are in, this, in the U.S.-U.K. relationship is not above your pay grade. And we're delighted to have you here tonight. It's a great privilege for us. Thank you for launching our series on the summits so, so widely and thoughtfully. It's a, you've set a great agenda for the rest of the series. We welcome you back to Chicago at any time, most especially the next time on May 19th, 2021. And we look forward to a continuing friendship in the years to come while you serve in Washington. Thank you so much. Thank you.